Shalom all, this is your brother Martin. And I'm recording this video due to some words I received over the last couple weeks which gave me all of the topics for my next seven videos. The first one being my testimony. Um, I have covered this testimony with individual people but I've never made a video about it. Um, I tried to record it a week ago only to realize I hadn't turned my microphone on. <clears throat> it wasn't actually this deck that I'm going to show you. So everything happens for a reason. I was told after I did it, I'd used the wrong deck. Because <laughs> this is the deck I had used for years to explain my testimony. You can think of this testimony as something to help you, if you're a Christian, to understand the part that's left out. Um, in, in what the Christians teach. So, um, the part that's left out is very important. I'm going to cover that in this video. I have no idea how long this is going to be. Um, so let's get to it. I have structured it so that you can follow along with it. It has a number of different parts. Uh, Alright, so, my testimony. So I'm going to talk about the stages of my journey first as a Christian and then specifically something uh, called the Ezekiel 4 prophecy that um, uh, happens to cause certain people to seek the old sources, which is um, written as an instruction in the Bible. Um, and uh, in that awakening, um, it leads to a number of places, um, which you see here, original names, the law, what is Israel, uh, all of that stuff. So we're going to cover all of that. Um, so let's talk first about, uh, just so you understand where I'm coming from, if you've been on my YouTube channel and you see the videos I put, put up and, well, I, I do have some kind of a, a calling, but, um, you might find that my journey is very much like yours. So the stages of my journey, I was raised a Roman Catholic, uh, baptized and confirmed in the Roman Catholic Church. I became a Protestant upon marriage. Um, not going to get into the reasoning, but anyway, I've been in different denominations, you could say. For the last 20 years before I uh, describe for you what happened in 2019, I was in a Christian church, same Christian church. I would go every week. Uh, I was very active in the church. I was elected to and served on the board of the church. Um, in 2018. Uh, that was, it turns out, just in time to witness everything that went on with COVID. Um, I actually began seeking the old paths that I mentioned in 2010, and you'll see why that's an interesting year uh, from what I show you coming up. And that's the start of my journey. This might be similar to your journeys if you've been raising a family and take them to church and teach them about morals and get all the stories and uh, all the parables and um, do all the traditions, then you're probably a lot like I was. Um, and, you know, that's totally understandable. That was my Christian journey. And I am now on what I would consider a post-Christian journey. Um, the Christian beliefs, which I think are helpful in understanding what I'm about to explain, uh, first thing is the Christians will tell you God is the creator of the universe. Um, they'll invoke the description in Psalm 19. Um, now, uh, in my uh, opinion, when we get into his name, um, you see videos on my channel about how uh, God is a different uh, name. <laughs> And, in fact, the Creator's name is Yehoiawa. So we'll get into that a little later. Uh, but we are created in His image. Um, and um, everything that happens here is a miracle. I'm not going to get into that. But basically, it's, it's all by the Creator's will. Um, the Messiah in the New Testament was the Creator incarnated in the flesh. So these are, you know, I'm just saying Christian beliefs that are still consistent with uh, what I would call my post-Christian journey, uh, which still shares a lot of elements of the Christian journey. 
um, but but again, uh, incorporating the parts that have been left out. Uh, the cru crucifixion of the Messiah absolves of, of our sins. Yes, that's the that's um, that is still the truth. We should act in kindness and love towards each other. Yes, baptism marks us as a Christian. We are to be disciples. Yes. The Creator pres presents Himself through nature. I added this because I, when I would review this with a couple of Christian friends, um, one of them brought this up, and, and I think that that is true. Um, we are to share the good news. The Holy Spirit is our common gift. Yes, yeah, so that's true. Um, and then again, when I would share this with other Christians, they said, you know, one of the things about this is that the human mind can comprehend the, the universe of which it is a part. Okay, all right, that's where we start to get a little bit uh, <laughs> further down from our place in, in the created universe, so I won't go there, but at least I'm listing out some things which um, you as a Christian might believe. So, um, those are all, I think, you know, I held those beliefs for decades and decades and decades, and then you opened my eyes. Um, now, whether you pronounce his name the way I've uh, described it as Yehoiwa, or whether you are on the path to pronouncing his name and you, you say Yehua, I think it's, um, it's all pleasing in his eyes. And so what happens uh, after Yehua opens your eyes uh, is what I'm going to describe. Um, because he might be trying to open your eyes. So for me, this was a supernatural intervention in November 2019. I was given a specific calling and I was made to realize the scriptures are of a living thing. Um, specifically, I was told in November 2019, remember this is a couple months before the first COVID um, uh, sightings, that evil would spread in the world and I was to witness against it. And um, I specifically heard, um, not audibly, but in my head, given given the phrase, you know what you need to do, now go do it. Um, and I will talk about what that meant in a minute. Um, as a result of this, um, my post-Christian journey is um, um, what we would call a Natsarim journey. Um, Natsarim is Hebrew for the ones restoring. When you hear a Christian talking about Jesus of Nazareth, it's because of Nazareth is a mistranslation of Natsarim. It doesn't mean from Nazareth. <laughs> it means uh, a type of, um, I don't want to say priest, but let's say disciple. Um, the ones restoring. A specific type of Christian that also observes the covenant in the Old Testament. And we're going to talk about what it means to observe the covenant in the Old Testament. But let me get back to this supernatural intervention where I was told, you know what you need to do, now go do it. Um, would it the, the, the manifestation of that was my production of Bible code tables. Um, from that point in time, November 2019, to a little more than a year later, I produced over a thousand Bible code tables, just showing you what they look like. Many of them you can find on my channel. And these are in Hebrew. Uh, I did not know how to speak Hebrew. <laughs> I still don't really know how to speak Hebrew. Um, and so I can't explain how I was able to produce, you know, dozens and hundreds of these Bible code tables confirming the word, except to say that it is a living word and the Holy Spirit um, can open your eyes to things that you didn't see before, which is exactly what happened to me. It was a supernatural intervention. Um, I originally published these code tables on a channel called The Code Searcher. Um, I was one of the first people to do code tables on COVID and on the, all the sorcery that happened after that, and many of these were published in the Code Searcher channel. Um, I was a member of the Code Searcher class, which would teach you Hebrew, but I never actually did any of the lessons. Um, and I think they recognized that the work that was coming from me was inspired, and so they would let me publish it on the Code Searcher channel. And then tens of thousands of 
people saw it um, and then many of those videos have disappeared so um, who knows how long this content will remain um, but uh, given uh, the protection of the remnant maybe it will remain for some time uh, we don't know so with that said let me go into uh, the next part of my journey and my testimony which is the um, which is the imperative to seek the old sources uh, and in our time it means the mistranslations of the English Bibles um, going from Hebrew translating to Greek translating from Greek to English and having politics involved um, has caused a lot of corruption in the word and so back in Jeremiah as thus says Yahuwah through his prophet Jeremiah he says stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for yourselves and he's talking to um, the Pharisees <laughs> uh, who of course say we do not walk in it um, so this is a instruction um, and we can say whether the original Bible the Torah was the law as the Pharisees claim or just the instruction um, we think of it as the instruction so besides going for the old sources but why is it that we seek the old sources well in this section of Ezekiel 4 it talks about an ancient fulfillment and a modern fulfillment of what is written here um, and it says um, that you need to lie on your left side and your right side a certain amount of days for the years of the crookedness of the house of Israel. after you've completed that you will have paid for the as it says the years of crook crookedness that have to be um, our consequence the consequence of the crookedness is this and in the ancient fulfillment this was the dividing of the 12 tribes of Israel into the two houses the northern house of Israel and the southern house of Judah which I had probably talked about in my videos um, but will be a subject of an upcoming video one of the videos that I talk about of the next seven videos um, and that was um, based on the math in that Ezekiel 4 prophecy it was a 430 year period and um, that happened in the ancient prophecy the modern fulfillment is given to us by a Bible code and I will describe this um, later but it is basically uh, uh, applies to the tribe of Ephraim and it is tied to the year 2010 uh, that's why I mentioned that I started seeking the old sources in 2010 it's part of the Holy Spirit moving within the world during the end of days um, all right so let's move on and we'll get in more into this when I get into the Ezekiel 4 code table uh, at the end where I talk about the ephod so <clears throat> when we seek the old sources the goal is to try and find the most truthful translation of the original so in my experience um, there are a few different ways to determine the most truthful meaning of the word the first is from an English translation which is fairly good but not always perfect called the Institute for Scriptural Research it will give you the gist of what the text is really saying the way that you will see that I do it in my videos is by using a soft piece of software called the interlinear scripture analyzer that actually goes and shows you all of the Hebrew letters and the word by word translation so you can see how um, the actual Hebrew reads if there is multiple meanings to a word which is very common in Hebrew there is the Strong's Hebrew concordance that is used and I actually um, find that the Dead Sea Scrolls is a remarkable witness given that um, there are Dead Sea Scrolls from before the time of Messiah that have been found including an entire scroll of the book of Isaiah so that we can know that in the 2000 or so year period it has not been altered from what was written in that scroll that was recovered and when you look in that scroll what you find is you will see the Hebrew flame letters that you see here which were 
um, how Hebrew was altered in order to protect Hebrew from the Babylonians when the house of Yehuda went into exile. And so the flame letters are not the original Paleo-Hebrew. And what you find as you look through the scrolls uh, that are written in that Babylonian flame letters is that there is one word that is always not changed into Babylonian flame letters, but, but is still in the original Paleo-Hebrew. And those four characters are the Tetragrammaton, which is the name of the creator. And so this is the actual creator's name that we see in the original text. And that is in Paleo-Hebrew characters, Yod, He, Wa, He, um, which, you know, some people pronounce Yahweh. Uh, those that have been on the path usually pronounce Yahuwah. And we, in our group of Nazarim, pronounce it Yehoiawa. Um, the original name is read from right to left. So the Yod is on the right. The He, the Wa, and the He then go from the right to the left. That tetragrammaton is in Paleo-Hebrew. Each Paleo-Hebrew symbol has a meaning um, as if it were a, an image. And the most amazing thing about the creator's name is that the meaning of the four characters of the tetragrammaton read again from right to left is hand behold nail behold so this is a signal of what is to come hidden in his name so from the original names that have all been changed in the bible and you can find those videos on my channel about what the original names are and why they were changed We'll get into what was the original, the oldest of the, 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 the Bible, which is what some would call the law, but we would call the instruction. Um, the, the actual law, so the, so the Torah, um, meaning the instruction that there is, there is actually only one law, which is Love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart and all your being and all your mind. Um, and the second law is incorporated in the first, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself, meaning um, that's it. <laughs> On these two commands hang all the Torah and the prophets, which are the all of the Old Testament, essentially. Um, and then, of course, the New Testament is uh, is an addition to the Old Testament, not replacing the Old Testament. Let's talk about Israel. So, so we, we, that's the point: is the, the the Torah, the law, the instruction from both Abba, the Creator, Yehoiwa, and His Son, Yehushua, is to love one another. Um, And even to demonstrate that by this all will know that you are his because of your love for one another. That is really the only law. All of these other things in the instruction are just um, tests for you. Um, and things become much easier <laughs> if you don't violate his will and his tests. But that said, if you do, as long as you repent of them, you are forgiven. That is the other lesson, is that love requires forgiveness. So in that, I think Christians and post-Christian Netzarim agree. This is the most important thing. Love is essential, and from love stems kindness and forgiveness, and it's required to achieve the purposes of the Creator. And in fact, um, the Creator enters into covenants versus contracts. Um, covenants cannot 
exists without forgiveness. When you enter into a covenant, think of the marriage covenant. You act for the good of the relationship. If your partner does something wrong, you don't just get to break it like a contract, citing that the other party did something wrong. You forgive the other party, and you always act in the best interest of the relationship, no matter what the other party does. That is not like a contract, right? The devil makes contracts and holds you to them. Our Creator makes covenants and forgives you as long as you repent of your mistakes. Covenants cannot exist without forgiveness. So let's move on from a discussion of the law, which is love, and move on to this idea of Israel, which is a big deception. It's not some political state in a desert far away from America where I'm recording this. What is Israel? Well, when in Matthew 15, a woman comes to the Messiah and says, um, could you help me with my daughter because she's demon-possessed? He answers, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you would say, wait, why would he say that to her? Well, who are the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Um, I mean, that's a pretty important statement, right? He's basically saying, I'm not here to help you with your demon-possessed daughter. It's not just about good and evil. I'm here for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Have we missed this every time we read Matthew? Um, so Israel is a bunch of tribes. Um, and back when this map was made, there were a few places. There is um, these tribes, the Ibrit, the Hebrews, that have 12 tribes. And they were in and among the heathen. According to the Bible, those were the Babylonians, the Canaanites, the Pelicites, all the Ites, and the Mitzrayim, which were the Egyptians. And so, uh, as time goes on, because of the corruption of the Ibrit, the nation of Israel is split into two houses, the house of Judah and the house of Israel. These are the two southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin in the house of Judah and the remaining ten tribes in the house of Israel. Um, I will just lump all of the ites in the previous slide and call them pagans. And we still have the Egyptians and we still have the Babylonians. And so this is, when we understand Israel, we have to start understanding first that there is a nation of Israel, which were originally the Ibrit, the 12 tribes, and then that, because of their disobedience, was split into two houses. And so when Yahushua says, I come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, you first have to understand what the house of Israel is. And now the next question is, who are the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Well, as we keep moving down this path, um, you have this occurrence where, because of their continued defiance, um, the house of Judah is exiled into Babylon, and eventually that leads to the corruption of the Torah and the, um, the emergence of the Pharisees that are in the temple when Yahushua shows up. Right? This is Yahushua in Paleo-Hebrew. He shows up a couple thousand years ago, and he's dealing with that remnant of the house of Judah, which are now the Pharisees, who have written the Talmud, and basically heaping, heaping laws that they themselves won't keep on top of the people, which is what Yahushua objects to. But then we have the other house, because of their continued defiance, was sent into exile and is now a diaspora among the pagans, which was roughly at that time Greece and Rome, and as we fast forward, these ten tribes have been mixed into 
all of the pagans, and those ten tribes are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This house of Israel was mixed into, essentially, Europe. And then, all of those nations eventually came over to what is America. And we're going to get into, in the coming videos, America and why it was formed and the role it plays now. But basically, he, the Messiah, is ministering to these exiled house of Israel in Greece and Rome. Or rather, he's ministering to them in Judah. And when Pentecost comes, he sends his disciples to go minister to the lost sheep. So he first teaches the ministry of the lost sheep in Judah. And then his disciples teach it through the Holy Spirit in Greece and Rome. This is why um, the Pharisee Paul, who converts and becomes, uh, Pharisee Saul, who converts and becomes Paul, is so important because he is really spread the testimony at that time. And he had to make the choice of whether he would become the greatest of the Pharisees or follow the Messiah. And he chose to follow the Messiah, which is a, it's a major milestone. Um, and it is, in, when he talks about spreading the good news, it's that good news here to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So... Um, this is explained in a video by Jim Staley, but it's pretty long, so I'm just going to summarize it here, which is that the, the, you know, the Bible talks about a bride and a groom, and um, the groom is the Messiah, and the, the bride is Ephraim, which is the, the resulting of this scattering. And because of that disobedience, that bride is exiled. And under Hebrew law, a bride cannot remarry unless her former husband dies. So basically, this bride has married the pagans. <laughs> um, and so, under the law, since the house of Israel was cut off due to violating the covenant, they could not return. So that is, if... It was not a covenant. If rather, like the Pharisees would say, it's a contract and you could not be forgiven, then there would be no way to forgive it. But if the husband, the groom, dies, then the bride can remarry. This is the reason the Messiah was crucified. Those ten northern tribes were in exile among the Greeks and Romans, the pagans. And Yahushua sacrificed himself out of love so they could return. That is the good news that Paul preached. He came to reestablish the importance of forgiveness, using himself as the example of the ultimate forgiveness. I'm just going to let that sink in. So if he's willing to do that, to follow the covenant, which requires you to forgive no matter what the other party does, then how can we say that that covenant does not apply to us as Christians? And that is the part that's being left out, my brothers. What the Messiah did was to renew the covenant, not make a new covenant. The idea that it is a new covenant is called the doctrine of Christian liberty. It is a misinterpretation. The good news that Paul preached to the Greeks and Romans was that they were no longer exiled because the Messiah restored the covenant. The only thing ended by the Messiah's sacrifice was the blood sacrifice in the temple. Since no new sacrifice is superior to his blood, all other parts of the covenant made with Abraham are still in effect for all Christians, even if they have been deceived into abandoning it and you have been deceived into abandoning it through the doctrine of Christian liberty, 
which preaches that there is a new covenant and that the old covenant was nailed to the cross with the Messiah. It was not. Only the blood sacrifice is stopped. So, that has many implications. Because if you look at the Old Testament of what you should be following under the covenant, you're not following it. And in fact, the traditions and the holidays you are keeping are pagan traditions and holidays. And so, you have the opportunity to repent for not keeping the covenant, in which case you will be forgiven. And this is why I am recording this testimony, so that you are aware that you still have the opportunity to repent of breaking the covenant and being forgiven because of the sacrifice of the Messiah. But your church will not teach you this teaching. And there's a reason for that. Which I discovered, which is why I left the church. So let's go into what you are supposed to follow if you have a relationship with Yehushua, the Messiah, and Abba, Father, Yehoiwa, our Elohim, the creator of the universe. So when I say Hebrew words, because they are pleasing to him, you will usually say the English translation immediately after, so that there is no confusion. Because I'm not here to confuse, I'm here to clarify. So let's talk about the covenant. The first thing about the covenant is that you keep the feasts. So right now, Ephraim, the ten tribes, the Gentiles, are not keeping the covenant because they do not keep the feasts or the calendar. You need to know the calendar of the Creator in order to know when the feasts are, to know to keep them. They are appointments with the Creator, personal appointments. So... In fact, what you find is that even in the political state of Israel, they're not keeping the covenants at mostly the right times because they've even corrupted the calendar. So under the parts of the covenant that remain, the most important thing is to keep the commandments, keep the seven feasts of Yehoiwa on the appointed days. These are spelled out in Leviticus. It's very clear. And then keep the calendar. Uh, to know when the seven feasts are, you need to know when the calendar is. And most people don't understand. What do you mean by the calendar? You mean just seventh day? Oh, do it Saturday instead of Sunday? No, that has nothing to do with it. The calendar of Yehoiwa is set in the heavens, and you must observe the heavens to know what day it is. All right, so um, I'm going to get into some of this, but there's more teaching out there if you look. Um, calendar of the Creator, Yehoiwa. So, my beliefs are Christian. I also obey the covenant of Abraham. Those that do this are called Nazarim, the ones restoring. We are restoring the old ways. Hamashiach, the Messiah, did this. He is our template. Keeping the feasts is required by the covenant. The appointed times are determined by Yehoiwa's calendar. It is set by natural cycles. It is very, very simple. It starts and ends with the moon. When you see the moon, the phases of the moon determine when the Shabbat day falls. And the Shabbat day always falls just after new moon when you see the first crescent. And then when you see the half moon, then the full moon, and then the half moon, and then again on the new moon. It takes a little bit of practice, but it's very easy once you know, and it is spelled out in the Bible. So, for instance, when I originally wrote this deck back in 2022, this was how it worked. When you first saw the crescent, that was day one. When you see the crescent, that's day one. And you really don't know when day one is unless you see the crescent. If you, somebody else tells you they saw the crescent, it's not really good enough. Your creator wants you to go and look and find the crescent. If you miss it, that's okay. Because then, if you heard somebody say, oh, I, it was on a Wednesday, I, I saw it, or you were on a Discord or 
Slack or some other place where you hang out with other people who follow these phases, then you can always go and on what should be the day before the Shabbat, look up and if you see a perfect half moon, then you know the next day is Shabbat. And that's, well, that's, the moon is its own witness. If you miss it the first time around, there's a second witness for you to go and see. Um, now, this one, two, these, these days, you know, it's funny. There's a one here, but it says day one is here. Day one of your count is always when you see the crescent. And then seven days later is the Shabbat. And then seven days after that is the next Shabbat. So this is day one. This is day eight. This is day 15. This is day 22. That's very, it's just that simple. And then the next one is 29. And so, when you find in the Bible that it says something happened on the 15th day of the month, you know that was a Shabbat. Or something happened on the 8th day of the month, that was a Shabbat. That, you will find, is actually very common when you look at the accounts of things that happened to the Hebrews in the Old Testament, is that things happened on those days, because those are the set-apart days. Shabbats are set apart days. They are appointments with Yehoiwa the Creator. Personal appointments. You don't want to miss them. He made them for you. So, um, if you're interested in knowing more about the Creator's Calendar, you can go to creationcalendar.com and you can see this URL, Proving the Calendar in Scripture. There is, are many, many, many um, pieces of Scripture on the calendar. And now let's talk about the last thing that he's given us so that we can be not confused during this time, during the end of days. Calendar is the first thing. If you look up, you can always tell what day it really is on the, the calendar of the Creator, and when your appointment with Him is, whether that's by a Shabbat or by a feast. If you want to know what the feasts are, I'm not going to get into all of them. You can find those on the internet, and you can read all about them in Leviticus chapter 23 and 24. Um, the next part, too, is that He gives us confirmations by means of an ephod. In the ancient days, when Yehua dwelled with the Israelites, this was by a vest worn by the high priest that had 12 stones in it, one for each tribe of Israel. And on a certain day of the year, this high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and through the ephod, Yahuwah would speak to the high priest. And the, these jewels would light up and they would cast characters on the walls of the Holy of Holies, and the high priest would be the one to bring the, bring the message back to the, the people of Israel. Um, that does no longer exist, because um, Yehua no longer dwells with the Israelites. But for the remnant, he has replaced the ephod with a modern ephod, and those are the Bible codes. The modern ephod only exists because the Bible itself is a database and there are keys to unlocking additional information. But this additional information is statistically significant and mathematically proven and um, whether or not it is, it's a matter of whether you believe that it um, adds to the original text. In my experience and the experience of other code searchers, the codes that are hidden in the text confirm the underlying text, and the underlying text confirms the codes that you find there. This code here is the Ezekiel 4 prophecy. The Ezekiel 4 prophecy in its ancient interpretation was the one that I showed you about the 430 years for the ancient um, house of Judea. But in its modern interpretation, it is a 2,730-year curse that lasted until the year 2010. How was that the case? It was um, that 430 multiplied sevenfold, 
which is the instruction on how much the consequence is for the violation of the covenant. Um, for the two houses, that would be 2,730 for the house of Israel and 280 for Judah, which gives us a total number of years. Um, and from the date that that was proclaimed until the expiration of this essentially curse in Ezekiel 4, that occurred in the year 2010. Um, and the year 2010 is encoded in the section of Genesis that says his seed will become the fulfillment, full, the fullness of the Gentiles. Um, and that is exactly what is happening. The remnant of the house of Israel is scattered in and amongst the nations, the Goyim, the Gentiles. And that house of Ephraim is now being awakened or rather, it has been awakened as of the year 2010. Um, and many of these people have awakened, right? And discovered the covenant in the Torah, the covenant. They will remember the Torah. Um, and it is a sign for Ephraim, hidden in, that they will hear. It is the birthright of the tribe of Ephraim, that they will remember me, says Yehoiwa. Um, here in Leviticus 28 is where it specifies that there will be a sevenfold increase for continued disobedience. As we said, um, the first disobedience was the 430. The second disobedience caused the exile of the house of Israel. That's what resulted in this sevenfold application. Um, and then we go back and we read again Ezekiel 4 5. Um, curse laid down on the house of Israel. So, um, as I said, this is only one of thousands of code tables that, um, that I did. The most amazing thing, if you, so if you, um, don't know anything about code tables or you haven't been to my channel before in the upper right hand side I have a link to understanding Bible codes the most important thing about a Bible's code is what's called the skip it is the uh, well you'll know what the skip is if you go and watch that book understanding Bible codes the most amazing thing about this Ezekiel 4 Bible code is that the skip matches <laughs> the most important number in the whole thing the sevenfold of 390 on the house of Israel. That is the skip of this table. Um, that, you know, I mean, what else can I say? <laughs> okay. There are also other tables about this, right? So there is um, one about the fullness of Gentiles. Um, uh, the expiration of the 430 years sevenfold in 2010, the completion of it for the house of Ephraim, that they as a remnant will understand, the remnant will understand the tribe of Ephraim. Um, and it is the completion of this sevenfold application of 430 years, the fulfillment of that in the fullness of Gentiles. The end of the curse of the 430 years. <laughs> Attaching to the word sevenfold. Um, really just amazing stuff. Right? This is not my table. This is another code searcher's table. I'm just decoding it and explaining it for you as part of my testimony. I've done plenty of my own tables, but my tables have confirmed other people's tables, and other people's tables have confirmed my tables. Um, there is much, much, much evidence. You just need to look. It's all there, right? Thousands of these. Um, all statistically significant. Some of them staggeringly statistically significant. And all very personal. I've 
I've found my name. I found all the names of my family members. I've, you know, found key dates like the death of my father. You know, so um, it's all in there. All of creation is in there. Um, you may or may not be allowed to ask that question. So searching codes is a an appointment from the Most High. Um, with that, I will say shalom to all of you, my brothers and sisters. I hope that this was a baruching for you and that um, this has helped you in your journey. Uh, and I will see you in the next video.